Welcome to Legal Tech Week, a uh, weekly or, or sometimes weekly journalist roundtable in which we talk about the top stories of the week. I am Bob Ambrogi. I write the blog Law Sites and have the podcast Law Next. And uh, our panelists, uh, as you see them before you today, are Molly, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Molly McDonough. I'm a media consultant based in the Chicago area, and I produce uh, the podcast Legal Talk Today. And uh, Zach? Hey, everybody. I'm Zach Warren. I'm editor-in-chief of ALM's Legal Tech <laughs> News. Also see me on Law.com, The American Lawyer, Corporate Counsel, and other ALM publications. Nikki? I am Nikki Black. I'm the Legal Technology Evangelist with My Case Law Practice Management Software. And I also write a lot. I write a legal tech column for ABA Journal. I write one for Above the Law. I write a weekly column for The Daily Record. And I also write weekly blog posts at the My Case blog. You do write a lot. You have been really uh, prolific lately. Uh, Joe. Uh, Joe Patrice from uh, Above the Law and the podcast Thinking Like a Lawyer. And um, right now blowing up on Twitter. So I'm, my thing's just dinging all over the place. So um, I keep looking away do? because I'm, well, I, I, I tweeted something earlier today that uh, that got retweeted by somebody who has a million followers. So now oh. it's like ding, 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 ding. And I, I keep one. I keep wondering if I've done, if people are yelling at me or not. I, so I'm a little, I'm freaked out by social media right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I am. Uh, all right. It, that, that's going to be a first, but uh, okay. Steve? Hi, I'm uh, Steve Embry. I write the blog uh, Tech Law Crossroads, which is about legal innovation and legal disruption. And like Molly, Joe, and Victor, I have worn my black shirt today. <laughs> Mine is a Christmas shirt. This is my Nakatomi Plaza Christmas party shirt. Well, that's a whole other conversation, but uh, Victor... <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Lee. I'm assistant managing editor with the ABA Journal. I handle the business of law and technology. And actually, you can't really see this is actually navy blue, but it looks black, you know, on the on the on, 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 the, on screen. Um, and yeah, I, I, I was gonna I was gonna mention that I saw Joe's tweet, I think on one of those, one of those aggregators that I, that I follow. And I was just like, Oh, <laughs> that's gonna blow up. <laughs> well, I'm curious now, what was it? <laughs> There was a guy on CNBC who cut like a WWE style promo about like how COVID isn't that dangerous and how like going, you know, going in, it was, it was that guy, Rick Santelli, uh, who was famous for, um, you know, doing that, 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 tea, that one of the original Tea Party um, screeds back in the day. And so he, he cut some like, some like, some like pro wrestling promo about how like, you know, COVID was, you know, um, how, how, how being being in a crowded being in a restaurant was no no different from being in a big store or that kind of stuff, and how, you know, uh, you can't tell them you can't tell them what to believe and blah blah blah, and, and it kind of blew up. And see, yeah, CNBC was that their host quite correctly cut him off and was like, "Look, it's a public health matter. I'm not going to let you keep saying these things." And they got in a screaming match, and I was like, "Look, this is this is the point where you've got to fire this guy, right? Like at a certain point, you have to have those sorts of standards, and that's what." Uh, is going nuts. Fair. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, and uh, the whole shirt cut conversation was actually turned out to be very relevant, what shirt you're wearing, because I just got off a call with Jared Correa, uh, who some of you may know does the Legal Toolkit uh, podcast on Legal Talk Network. I was a guest on his show. And we got into this whole offline conversation. It's not part of the podcast, but we decided we need to do another podcast sometime about swag <laughs> uh, and, a, and a whole conversation about swag. And I, I don't know if you all saw Joshua Lennon's uh, tweet that he got going this week where he's going to, he's, he's vowing, I guess he's asking vendors to send him uh, their clothing swag and he's going to wear something every day, I guess, and post it on Twitter or something. And I'm like, I mean, that's, that's my daily, <laughs> that's how I dress every day. I mean, it's <laughs> some t-shirt from some conference I've been to at some point along the line. It's like, at first, I thought he was he was just going to pull things from his closet, and I was yeah. like, "Gosh, that's a lot of swag." And uh, then I started th kind of doing an inventory. Do I have that much clothing? You know, I have my, my core pieces, you know, fast case and um, or my favorite t-shirts, and you know, s some of those. But and um, Cleo has really soft t-shirts, so. But I I don't think I don't think I have nearly that much. But I think Joshua might even just have enough socks. Right. 
And then well, I have uh, I have a lot of swag from one company. It's called it's called My Case. I probably have thirty <laughs> pieces of clothing for real. Like, <laughs> you should you should definitely send some to Joshua Lennon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely right? send it. To uh, I, I was always getting those reusable bags because uh, because because my, my wife likes using them for like shopping. So I would I would take like a like a bag from every conference that I went to. So I have like four or five like Clio bags, a bunch of tech show bags, and a, so it was great. But then once they once they stopped uh, allowing you know allowing us to use reusable bags well for shopping, then it was kind of like all right, now we have all these bags. What do yeah. we do with them? That's what I was going to say, too, is we were moving over the summer and my wife said, so what is Ilticon and why do you have stuff packed in bags from three different years to move? And I'm like, well, if it's there and helpful, then it's there and helpful. So yeah. not gonna argue. I still have a, a large supply of this famous Tech Law Crossroads, no BS T-shirts. So, yeah, that was good. Well, <laughs> you can always wear those forever. <laughs> think, you know, it's holiday season. Think of those you uh, love, Steve, and uh, we all take one. I've I've got my my case shirt right here, my my case cup right here, my Clio shirt on. <laughs> and, but as and I said no to, to Joshua, this, how right? come nobody does legal briefs? That's the one thing I haven't seen in the whole swag department. But anyway, because um, nobody would see it. The whole point is for them to see your logo. I it's guess your underwear. That makes Some sense. Well, they do it, socks. Who general. sees socks? Everybody <laughs> sends socks. How many people see your socks? When you cross your legs, I don't know. Or you could yeah. wear high waters, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, from swag to the to the big news of the week, virtual virtual conferences. <laughs> uh, it happened, everybody. It's finally happening. <laughs> it happened. I mean, how long yeah. have we been talking about? How long has Nikki been talking about this? Right. I'm upset. So, <laughs> but, but she is vindicated. She is vindicated this week. So what happened, Nikki? You want to you want to fill us all in, or? <laughs> well, so um, Steve was kind enough to tell me about the e discovery day um, that EDRM was hosting a virtual platform for a portion of that e discovery. The sort of I guess it's like a celebration. I don't know if it's conference. I think it's a conference every year. But so they had a virtual platform where you created your avatars. And um, it really felt like a conference center, kind of like the um, that one in D that's outside of DC, the Harbor Bay, or I forget what it's called. That one that National we go Harbor. gone to for yeah, National Harbor felt a lot like that sort of like a campus, and it had buildings, uh, all different kinds of buildings, and um, a beach and a boat and uh, a lighthouse you could walk to the top of and look out at the view. Um, but it was a uh, it was. I thought it was awesome because it, you had these serendipitous meeting um, interactions with people and you like, I, people are laughing out loud sometimes. Like it was like when I met a lot of people I never would have otherwise met within the first few minutes of being there. Um, <clears throat> I went on a whole bunch of boat rides and we learned that if you weren't standing up when the boat took off or if you stood up when they stopped the boat and then they started the boat again, you would slide off into the water and they'd have to come back and get you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a ton of fun, Either, uh, you know, and it, it sounds strange, but it was, it was, it felt a lot like a conference because you could um, say, hey, let's go meet up here. You'd go and find somebody or walk into the expo hall and, you know, you would stand around and talk to people and you felt like you were talking with them. I don't know. You guys tell me what you thought, but I thought that it really added to that flat virtual just zoom, zoom, zooming all the time, which gets super boring. But you guys, yeah. let me, some of you are there. So tell me what you think. I had a great time. I mean, it, it, the good thing about it was you could you would see small groups of people having conversation, having a conversation, and you could you could walk right up to them and and join the conversation. Uh, in fact, Nikki, I think you said it, it's, it's a little bit awkward, like sort of like in real life when you walk up to a group of people and you don't maybe you know one person, and uh, but then you, if you walked away from that conversation, the, the 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 voices would fade into the background just like normal, and then you could go to another one. And the exhibit hall was was really interesting because there were booths and you could walk up to the booths and you, you know, if somebody was, in fact, I met, bumped into Bob at one of the booths and we sat and talked for a little while and you know, then we moseyed on and ran around. And uh, I thought it was, uh, you know, I don't know how the, like a presentation would work with that, although they did some presentations. Um, 
Uh, they had a, a, a drink mixing thing and a, and a, a memorial for Gail that, that was sort of on screen. But, but those the presentations did, were live, were actual video of real people, right? Yeah. Or the one yeah, I saw. Not the one I saw. Yeah. Right. And, and then it was, that was a little, um, I don't know about that, but, but just the interaction part of yeah. it you know, was, was, was great. I mean, I, I bumped into, to, to Bob and Nikki last night that you, you had an ability to find somebody's name and that, that would take you to them. And I took around all these little corners and nooks and crannies. They were way in the back in the corner by the beach someplace that I never would have found. And but we just well, sat there. The reason we were there was because I was at the beach and I get, went over to the boat and I was going to try and drive it. And some guy jumped on the boat. He never introduced himself. He never talked to me. He just drove the boat away. <laughs> got off, got out of the boat and ran away. And so I was like, I want to explore where I'm at. And so I wandered yeah. around a little bit and all of a sudden Bob showed up and then Steve showed up and we we're in this random weird place where there was nothing going on. Like, by on the, the beach. beach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, we were talking on uh, the uh, Ari Cap one lunch, I guess, yesterday. Uh, and Ari brought up the fact that that with the video games that you know, a lot of the kids play like the Madden uh, football games and the basketball games, the, the players are very lifelike and very realistic. And I wonder at some point in the future, whether we'll have the ability not to be sort of a, this, this wonky looking avatar that they had you pick from, but we'll really look more or less like us. Uh, and when, and we get to that point, you know, I think that would be cooler, but maybe it wouldn't, I don't know. <laughs> But that's actually one of the interesting things was how much uh, uh, Nikki. I wish you could show your avatar because your avatar looked like you. Yeah. And Steve did a pretty good job with his avatar. Mm. I, I didn't see Zach. I didn't see yours, Molly. I I walked right through you <laughs> <laughs> at some point. <laughs> I don't know how I did that. I didn't get. I was thinking I should get like a brain meld or something when that happened, but it it, it didn't happen. Uh, but one, one of the things I thought was really interesting that also made it feel like a real conference is like, like you land there, you land in the sort of welcome area when you first log in. And it's like a real conference in that you're like, okay, like, where do I need to go? Where, what room am I supposed to be in? Where's the exhibit hall? How do I get there? And you're kind of like going through this process of exploring the area a little bit. And then, uh, uh, as you say, you can kind of join conversations, but it's also interesting that the, uh, the the sonics of it are such that if there's a group of people talking as you get closer to them, it gets louder and louder until you're right there. And then it's like full volume and, you know, you can kind of walk over and, and as, as Nikki said, it's sort of, you know, awkwardly wait to see if they notice you and say hello or not, or, or uh, reach out and shake their hand. But it's, it's, it's very much like a real experience of, of being somewhere, or at least as close as I've been uh, in eight months to, to being at a real thing. So. Yeah, the way they did the panel discussion was pretty slick, too. I popped in for that for a little bit. Ron Hedges, Mary Mack, and a few other people. Essentially, they had a video board, which there were video boards all over the place. You could put advertising and such. But they had pre-recorded, essentially, a Zoom call, and it played seamlessly on the video board in the virtual world. So it was a bunch of people seated, like they would be seated in an auditorium. You could mute the crowd. They had the capability in those rooms. And then it just played the presentation. Um, so I thought that was kind of a cool mix of still getting that lifelike feel. You're able to see people's faces on the board, see the PowerPoint that they wanted to, but you're still in this virtual world. And like I did halfway through, if I wanted to check something else out, I could get up and go check something else out. Um, so it, I liked it overall. Um, I've also got the uh, exhibit hall behind me and you can even see like names of vendors and people standing at the booths as you were walking by. It was cool. Yeah. And Molly, the one thing that was funny. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, you know, for I, I, I thought it was great. I thought it, um, there have been, I think Sarah Glassmeyer just mentioned that it was, it sounds similar to second life. I've, I've seen lots of comparisons to second life and Minecraft. Uh, you know, there are like Steve said, opportunities to really make this more realistic. Um, but I thought that it was, it was great to be able to have these interactions and to be able to go off into a corner and talk to people. Um, I did meet a few people, which was, uh, which was great. It's all, that's always a bonus. Uh, and the other thing is if folks are doing this, I, the thing I would recommend the most is that you find a way to on-ramp your audience so that they test it out. Cause Nikki spent a lot of time and then prepped us on how to get, 
get going um, in, with some kind of simple, simple instructions. And I didn't get that from the conference. Um, so, you know, that kind of how on to do backflips and other things like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <The dance. laughs> right. For the advanced users, but just having that, you know, spent, you know, encouraging people to spend 15 minutes creating their avatar, getting ready, getting everything set up, um, was, a was, um, was use was really helpful. It, it was still a little challenging to get moving around the first time, but, you know, having spent a little time in advance really helped. Since, since Bob uh, complimented Nikki's uh, avatar, Nikki, if you would move a little bit, we could all see your avatar. <laughs> look at that. It's like it a spinning like image. <laughs> <laughs> well, the um, other thing that was interesting about it was, Bob sort of alluded to it, when you're near crowds of people, it's loud. So at one point I said to people, I can't hear you, it's really loud. Let's move over here so we can talk where it's quieter. And like, as I were all walking over to like this, <laughs> and, trying, and it was funny too because people didn't know how to walk so they'd like completely overshoot and end up 10 feet away and have to turn around and come back and then awkwardly turn their avatar around so it was facing the other people but you know like it was just so strange that it felt like we had to move away because it was a little bit too loud where we were <laughs> so right. I definitely I ended up in the woods yeah. I ended up in the woods and on the hill by accident uh, by the <laughs> I, I, but I, yeah. I feel like I came from just a like every I conference like you go I, to Right. <laughs> but I feel like I interacted with people and I feel sort of um, invigorated, like I feel after conferences and uh, not hungover, though. None of that hungover stuff going on. So that was good. So. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the virtual alcohol wasn't so good. Um, so uh, I, and, and we actually and, and Kaylee Wallstead, who is, uh, is is here listening today, who's who's uh, she and Mary Mack were the the two at EDRM who made, who, who came up with this idea and, and made it possible. And uh, uh, maybe stay tuned. We're, we're going to, we're talking to Kaylee and, and Mary about maybe we can set up so we can do our Friday virtual round table sometime uh, in this virtual environment and uh, sit around and talk and have everybody get a taste of it. So that would be really fun if we can do that. And, and, and we, and also love that when, uh, Nikki and Steve and I went went looking for Kaylee and Mary at this conference to go ask them uh, whether they might consider this. And uh, they said, sure. But first they made us dance uh, <laughs> before they listened to our conversation. So uh, like 20 people, they had it. We showed up right at the beginning of a group dance or like after we do the group dance, they're like five, four, three, two. And then everyone just started dancing <laughs> like 20 people. And everyone was laughing because it was so funny. Like yeah. people were just guffawing. It was like, I don't know. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was surprisingly fun. Yeah. Somebody's asking, Joe Scott is asking how this is different from the legal tech virtual conferences they tried a few years ago, but never caught on. Maybe just the COVID times will make it work now. I don't actually remember the legal tech virtual Those conferences. Those didn't have avatars I've... though. Those were just literally like all the other flat conferences we're seeing, if I remember correctly. That's what I It was I'm basically thinking, yeah. just, you know, you show up and it's a web page and you click on links to, it looked like a, you know, conference hall or something, but really it just was like following links to the vendors right. little presentation or following a link to a webinar. And yeah. that was just like all the other conferences. They're very flat yeah. in my opinion and boring. I yeah, am for curious. Oh, go ahead. I was just about to say, I am curious though, if this is something that will continue even beyond the COVID times, um, because it is one of those things, like, as we're talking about it, it feels so lifelike, like you're at an actual conference, but when you can go to actual conferences again and have those experiences, is this something there's still a place for? Um, I think there very well could be because it draws people from all over the country. You don't have to pay travel costs, et cetera, but it, you, still, it's nice to have the in-person experience, obviously. So I, I can see back kind of both sides of it. Yeah, I, I think really that probably the most impressive part of it would have been, I think, for the vendors. I, I don't know. I'm not a vendor. But um, so far, I've just not seen a, a virtual conference that has come up with a good way to uh, to get the attendees and the vendor, vendors to interact uh, and this was very much, as everybody said, I mean, you wander around the exhibit hall, you see a booth that interests you. There's, you can see that there's somebody standing there or not. You can see which booth had people standing there or not. You wander over and it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, you're having a verbal conversation with the person, not, not just texting or something. 
Uh, and it's, you know, it may be somebody, you know, and you ask them how they've been and what's up, or if it's not, you can ask them about their product and they can show you, talk to you about it and show you a little demo. Uh, it was very realistic in that sense. Yeah, I like that too. And I was wondering, Bob, as you were talking, whether vendors who, from everything I've heard, are very dissatisfied with with sort of the quote exhibit halls that we have had so far, they may very well insist on something like this in exchange for paying you know the exhibitor fees because. It is so much better. I mean, you can actually, you know, who's, who's there. It's not like you have to enter a chat room and you don't know who's you'd be talking to, you know, who's at the booth. You can see them, you know, you can interact, you can have a discussion. You can, you can see a demo for all the reasons you said. And, you know, I'm not a vendor either, but if I was, I think for my money's worth, I would much rather have this than, than the other options that have been out there so, so far. Yep. So what else? Are we, what else is there to talk about this week? Uh, I'm looking at. We have this fancy spreadsheet filled up, set up that people are supposed to enter their stuff in, uh, and uh, a lot of blank spaces on it this week. So I'm not sure. I, I put mine in. You put yours on the wrong day, though, Joe. You put yours on <laughs> oh. last week's tab. But it took me a while wait, to wait. find it. You're there. Oh, if you're talking about I, I, Pacer, I, is that what you're going to talk about? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I, I just I, I thought we were just updating it at the same page every week. I didn't oh, know we have we a little a tab for each our... show. A tab for ah, each show. Right. We're keeping it for posterity. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put stuff up. That's all I, all right. that, that was what I did. All right. Well, you get, you get credit. So what did, what did you put up? What do you want to talk about? So Pacer, um, we've talked before about the Pacer lawsuit and so on. Um, and the growing attention people are giving to the idea that the federal government charges us for public documents at 10 cents a page, despite the fact that that's not been a reasonable thing to be charging for years. Um, at this point, there's now a bipartisan bill to make this change, to make PACER free and uh, give access to the courts. And what was what came up is that apparently the administrative office of the judiciary was sending out talking points to federal judges for them to use to lobby Congress members to vote against this bill. Uh, it seems dubious ethically to do that. Uh, it's really... Um, a lot of the things that were said in these talking points were wildly insane. They were making comments that making PACER free would require a, an investment of $2 billion to make a database for static documents. Uh, it really, really weird stuff. Uh, and, and it's, it's troubling uh, that the judiciary would, uh, would condone something like this. Yep. Anybody have thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought it was pretty bizarre that the, that the judiciary was 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 doing that. Um, yeah, I, I, I just uh, the uh, do we know is, has the bill moved recently, or, or do we know what the status of that is? Or uh, it got out of committee, uh, but I don't think anything's happened since then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that with um, <laughs> the uh, the um, you know the line between like you know what judges are allowed to do, like like as far as like lobbying goes, I know that's always been kind of a gray area and, and, and not something that's really, I mean, I mean, sometimes, sometimes some, some justices historically have had no problems going up to Capitol Hill and be like, I think you do this, 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 and this. And then sometimes they'll go and like testify formally, but yeah, it just, it just kind of smacks us. It just kind of smacks of like, of, of, you know, like getting, getting talking points from a, from a, from a, you know, to then, to then go and like lobby, lobby um, Congress. Just, it, it just, it, it just seems very unseemly, but you know, I guess, we live, we live in a different age now. Yeah, there was the uh, ruling from the federal court in August on PACER fees that basically, what, sent the, if I'm trying to remember what happened. They said they, they basically said that you have to send the, uh, the case back, I think, to the trial court for further, further, uh, further proceedings. Uh, but... Um, Basically, they did find that some of the fees were being excessively charged, as I recall. I'm trying to remember. I forgot to look back at that yeah. today. But uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the points that you made in your write up of that originally was that, which is what the, I'm trying to find. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I, I read it. it, it it's actually linked in my piece. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. But one of the one of the things that you pointed out was that the ultimate end of that lawsuit was 
you know, we need to rely on Congress to make the change, which you said, you know, uh oh, uh, getting Congress to agree on something. But this is weirdly something that there's bipartisan support for, uh, because amazingly, we can all come together about the idea that this is insane. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. not about, you know, more pressing matters that are insane. But hey, you know, it's a start. Yeah. Yep. And but what else yeah, is I new? <laughs> I don't know if they'll have time to pass it, though. I mean, it seems like it seems like well, it seems like Congress has more pressing things to to to, to discuss. Um, not that pacer isn't important, but yeah, I mean, between COVID relief and between all these other things. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I don't know if they'll be able to get to it before the end of the term, which means then they'd have to redo, you know, like start from scratch at the, uh, you know, for the next term. But you know, who knows? Maybe, 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 you know, maybe it'll be it'll be, it'll be a better thing 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 to just start over with with the new administration coming in. Right. Well, since uh, Courtney Trauman here in the audience thinks that uh, Pacer is really exciting and racy, we have more court docket stories to talk about. <laughs> uh, right, Molly? Uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, bring up a, uh, a demo we that Steve and I got to see on Tuesday by Trellis. Um, they're, they've been expanding into different states and just came into Cook County, Illinois. And they're doing these um, analytics and data points for um, the state courts. So uh, where we've been relying on the trickle down effect of um, guessing kind of what jury verdicts would be based on um, what's happening in the federal courts in aggregate, you know, they're really looking at, at aggregating full state data and really interesting points. And it just, it, I, I was excited to see them coming into Illinois or just interested at least because I know Illinois is really tricky, like actually a lot of states to be able to get the full state. So, how do you know, I, that? you know, I just, I, and I, you know, I personally know that because, <laughs> because in 2001 and I have, I have show and tell, I created the um, Illinois trial reporter for ALM and had to work with all 102 counties um, to get the the data um, that that trellis is now aggregating by state and um, and I think Steve referred to it in one of his posts as the the Google of um, of, uh, of of do state court of the state courts yeah, uh, state for court data. yeah. state court <laughs> analytics yeah. um, but this is you know verdict Intel um, you can they've they're starting to be able to drill down by by party so that you can see um a judge's stats whether they you know what their record is ruling on behalf of plaintiffs versus defendants um and i mean this is really in the weeds information that we just haven't had access to that um you know maybe through some of the state trial verdict reporters um, that we've seen in the past and some and there are some like you know the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin um, does this for Illinois but there really aren't very many competitors to them in Illinois um, so it'll be really interesting to kind of see how this shakes out how controversial it'll be with some of the states we talked a little bit about that whether um, the judges will want, will push back uh, what was kind of exciting to me is that uh, the data that they're collecting is very similar to what I'm seeing um, Miami courts using to be able to improve their case management uh, um, systems. So, you know, I can see the courts really wanting this, especially the courts that don't have the resources that a Miami has um, to be able to, to be able to subscribe or use this type of data that's coming in from a third party um, looking at their system. They're aggregated across the state. Um, so it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how this how this develops if if they're able to get into more states. And what I thought was unique about them is that they really are focused on state courts to the point where if there's a county that can't get them the information electronically, they're still sending runners to pick it up so that they can get everything. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah, I did. Uh, I interviewed that's the Nicole old way of doing it and did a post on it some time back. I was and, and was really high on it. Um, First, Nicole was a former litiga litigator and in state court, um, and so she had a has a good feel for what lawyers litigators need and want out of some of these analytical programs. And <clears throat> you know, the the reason I called it the, the one of the reasons I called it the the Google of state court analytics is if you can Google an inquiry about a state court or or holding, 
and uh, the trellis site will pop up and uh, you can get some information out of it for free. And then of course it's a little teaser to, to, to bring you in to get more, but I thought that was really neat. And the search capabilities were, were really quite interesting. And, you know, Molly makes a good point and it's a point I made it, uh, getting information out of state court, uh, county court clerks is, is, is not as easy as you might think. I mean, you do have to do some snoozing uh, with these, a lot of these people for them to cooperate with you since it's, you know, not necessarily their job or their highest priority. So I can imagine all the, uh, the work that the trellis folks have had to do in, in gathering this. Um, and there are competitors and it, you know, it's kind of a crowded space. I mean, Lexus Nexus is, is, wandering into the state court analytical area too. But the impressive thing about Trellis, I thought, is this is all they want to do. I mean, they are laser focused on this. And uh, as we all know, you know, successful startups often are those who are very, very focused and they are. Yeah. I mean, there is, there's Gavalytics out there also, which is very similar in terms of their focus. Uh, they, they're getting into more and more states. I mean, they were, they were, just California when they launched, as was Trellis. Uh, and uh, they're also expanding. They're saying now that by the end of the year, they'll have 20 states coverage in 20 states, but not 100% coverage. Uh, you know, it's, it's major metropolitan areas anyway in, in those states. And, and uh, yeah, Lex Machina has been uh, expanding its state coverage as well. So I don't know if I'd call it a crowded space so much, but it's de definitely a space in which there's uh, a lot more uh, activity going on. That activity, I think, is going to be something that's interesting to track, though, because it does seem like a little bit of a gold rush where everybody started in California. The data there might have been a little bit more accessible. And now everybody's just trying to pick off like Lex Machina trying to go into New York, Gavalytics trying to go into Florida, pick off these individual states and establish their market share before anybody else can get there. So whoever wins that race probably will have an, a leg up for a long time. Um, it's just a matter of being able to f be the first one to get that data. And whoever, would, I don't have a prediction or a horse in the race, but just as an avid watcher of the space, I'm very interested to see who wins that rush. You know, it's uh, yeah. just knowing somebody the other day, it's a, it's a great time to be a litigator, right? You got all these companies competing in the field on price and quality and service. And, you know, if you're a litigator now, you got Wow, look at this! Look at all this stuff I can get. <laughs> Steve yeah, and I argue it's, it's, over who came up with the phrase that if you're not using legal analytics, litigation analytics, you're committing malpractice. Bob, <laughs> that, so I, I think that Zach's exactly right, and and to to Steve's point, that this is you know the difference though is going to be what Steve is saying is you know you can really compete then on price and and quality, and one of the things that I think. Um, that I, I found so attractive with, with what I've seen so far from Trellis is that they're focused a lot on user experience and intuitive use. So it's a, just a really easy um, product to navigate um, just by glance. And that's, that's got to be a decent selling point for them. Um, so, but it'll be harder for firms, I, I think, to, to you know, shop around and it, the more, more folks come into the field. Yeah. The, the one other big hurdle for all of these companies is that there are some states that just don't have easily accessible uh, docket information in any electronic format. Uh, Massachusetts, where I am being one of them, uh, is, there's just the Massachusetts courts have been highly uh, protective of their online data and make it very hard to get uh, access to docket data, especially for any kind of commercial providers. Uh, and uh, other states uh, are, are in, in similar situations or don't even have the data really uh, adequately available online. So that's, that's a, a, a speed bump for all of these companies and trying to get all national coverage, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, uh, for example, in my state, it's electronic filing is still optional. Um, but having said that, you know, um, we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Any, right. any information and data out there um, is better than, you know, sort of the wild ass guess that we, most of us have lived with for our careers. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, it is going to be difficult and, and going back in time is going to be difficult because um, 
even if a state were to today say we're going to do solely electronic filing, they're probably not going to go back and put all their their paper filing in data form. But as time goes on, we get more and more data and we get more and more information and, you know, query, you know, what what good is litigation data that's 10 years old or five years old anyway, really, when you start thinking about it. <laughs> true. I guess that's true. Um, looking at lots of empty spaces. Vic, Victor, you had uh, something you wanted to talk about uh, this week. You want to want to fill us in on that? Yeah. So um, I guess uh, there was a story that I saw uh, in ZDNet about how I guess IBM cybersecurity division um, found that uh, hackers are hackers from a nation state um, are targeting the links of the potential uh, distribution chain for the COVID vaccine. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, I think they're probably hesitant to say who it was, but I think based on, based on the emails that they published and sort of the, the, the phrasing of, uh, of certain words, pretty obvious it's China, but, um, uh, but, you know, you know, I, I think one thing that they were, they, they were doing like a, like a fishing kind of, um, efficient kind of campaign targeting uh, people like you know, like because it, it used to be that they were just focusing on manufacturers like uh, Johnson Johnson Pfizer but now they're looking at you know like who are the who are the who are the companies who are the industries organizations that will be responsible for helping to transport uh, the vaccine so I think they they, they targeted like um, driest manufacturers they targeted um, uh, you know, transportation uh, um, companies and things like that so you know I, I mean I think I think it just shows you that that you know, a hackers are never going to miss an opportunity to try to to try to um, get an advantage to try to uh, get 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 their hands on 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 valuable data. It doesn't matter doesn't matter what it is. You know, uh, even something like you know something as important that you would hope that that <laughs> that uh, you know would would be safe as safe as possible from interference uh, that that we're all relying on, uh, like like distribution of a vaccine for COVID. Um, hackers are still going to try to make their play and try to try to get this information, and nothing is safe. And people really need to, you know, be cognizant of that and need to, um, you know, again, brush up on their basics, you know, make sure, make sure they safeguard everything and, you know, don't open any emails that look suspicious. And I think there's actually uh, that, in addition to the, the broad interest of that story, it actually maybe loosely relates back to one of the legal tech stories of the week, which was Xtero's announcement yesterday of its acquisition uh, of access data for we don't know how much, but uh, nine figures, somewhere north of nine figures uh, is all we know. And that's a, that's a big range of north. But uh, uh, I, I, it, I mean, I think part of what uh, Xtero, part of the reason Xtero wanted uh, access data, uh, various reasons, but part of it was for its access data, sort of data breach and data breach analysis tools uh, and uh, you know, I think Xero is really trying to position itself as a sort of soup to nuts uh, data uh, uh, data software company for for the legal community. And that whole area of data breaches and investigating and responding to data breaches and detecting them is a major area of focus if you're going to be dealing with data. So uh, I think there's a relationship there. Yeah, when we talked to Xtero um, about it yesterday, Reese Dipshan with LTN did, and uh, they basically made the point that, you know, if you're still thinking about e-discovery as kind of its own little self-contained bubble, you're probably looking a little bit too narrow because not only is data all across the enterprise and has so many different uses, but even e-discovery tools can be used for information governance, for privacy, et cetera. It is kind of all increasingly wrapped up in one these days. And there are a couple different ways that I know e-discovery companies can go, whether they're really doubling down on technology and review, kind of like somebody with Reveal was doing with NextLP, or you can go the other way with Xtero, really go into privacy and data breaches. But in the end, it is all data. Um, and that's something that all organizations in a lot of different forms are having to try and grapple with now. Well, one of the issues that I've seen come up several times lately um, is, you know, when, when a law firm produces uh, data to another law firm, what obligation does the law producing law firm have to make sure that the law firm that gets the data 
can adequately protect it, that has adequate safeguards uh, in their system to prevent it from being hacked and personally identifiable information being revealed. And, you know, it's a dicey area because, you know, most law firms are going to say, well, of course I do, you know, and what are you going to say? Give me the proof. You're going to go to the judge and ask the judge to show you the proof or, you know, it's, it's a thorny area and it can, it can be a sticky wicket, I think, for, for law firms that are producing massive amounts of sensitive data. Yeah. Sorry, Zach, if I just stole your story, <laughs> but I, I figured you'd no, comment. I, I didn't put anything in the spreadsheet this week. So no, you didn't steal anything. <laughs> it was my bad. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, well, anything else you want to talk about this week? Um, put me on the spot now. Um, it just, I mean, we talked obviously about the Avatar conference, but just e-discovery day in general, I think is definitely worth a mention because it is something in speaking of Xtero that they started five years ago. And I think a lot of people saw it as, oh, this is just going to be Xtero's little thing. But I think it really has grown to be an e-discovery industry day event. Um, I was on a webcast yesterday that was Lighthouse e-discovery, not even Xtero at all. Um, EDRM had a bunch of sponsors, including Xtero, but they're in outside organization as well. So I do think it's kind of fun to see so many people adopt eDiscovery Day as something that is worth celebrating and that has grown from being just one vendor's day or one vendor's conference to being kind of more of an overarching industry thing. Except that you're lobbying for lobbying for it to be renamed Discovery Day, right? Uh, well, <laughs> By the results of my survey, <laughs> there are a lot of people that would like to drop the E. Um, I'll roll with it for now. Okay. Yeah, I actually thought about that when I was writing about the writing about it yesterday. Do I want to call it Discovery Day? Uh, all right, uh, Steve. How about you? What you have this week? Uh, yeah, I I, uh, I mentioned uh, an article by uh, Dan Rowe who was talking about an increase of uh, contingency fee billing arrangements with business litigation. And um, the, the firms that he mentioned were either a mayor, mayor, a, 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 a stand up, well known plaintiff's law firm, uh, or they were boutique firms. And that, so I wrote a post commenting up upon the difficulty of most law firms uh, whose business model is billable, bill by the hour, in, in adopting. Uh, contingency fee arrangements or uh, alternative fee arrangements. And it's mainly because the, the compensation and advancement systems of those firms, uh, most billable hour firms hinges on number of hours, number of hours that you bill, uh, if not in whole or in part, certainly for associates, it's a key component. So when you're trying to manage a contingency fee case, um, you know, more is less, right? You, you, you want to have the work done by the lowest cost uh, provider that, that can adequately do the work. And you want to reduce the amount of hours because that expands the amount of profit. And so try asking an associate, hey, would you like to work on this contingency fee case? He says, like, oh, no, I don't know about that. I've got to reduce that. You don't want me to bill as many hours. And the same is true for, for partners. I mean, most, most big law firms have partner quotas uh, that uh, you know, look for partners to bill hours. And so you're, the, those firms, are, they're now left with a choice, right? They can either say, okay, on a contingency matter, you don't have to record your time, which is not very likely uh, because how else are you going to evaluate what a lawyer has done over the years or over the year, or you're going to say, okay, record your time so we can assess the profitability of the matter. And so then what happens is since there's no client looking over everybody's shoulder and saying, I don't think that's a good uh, usage of time to research that to the bitter end or to fly all over the place and take depositions back when we do had that opportunity. So what happens is more time is plunked in the matter than, than maybe would be if there was an actual client reviewing a bill. And at the end of the day, the firm management looks at the, at the, at the fee and the result and says, we lost money on this deal which may or may not be true because the assessment is based on billable hours as opposed to profitability and end result. And so, you know, I, I, what I've seen over the years is despite all the, the, the brouhaha over alternative fees and contingency fees, at least in most 
uh, larger law firms that bill by the hour is it's just not not been that well adopted and not been that well not profitable because and again you know even in in estimating those kinds of fees and making the profitability estimates uh, most law firm leadership assesses hours how many hours is this going to take us to get to the end whereas a content true contingency fee lawyer will look at how long is it going to take me to get to the end what is the potential payoff and how much time will have to be spent on the matter? Uh, what's the minimum I can spend on the matter and still get the best possible results? So it's a different different uh, evaluation. So I, that was my post for the week is, you know, how difficult I think that is for many law firms whose, whose uh, business model is primarily the billable hour. Any thoughts on this? I, despite all their rage, they're still just billing rats in a cage, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like we've been talking about it. I, like I, I got into this business, what? Um, I started writing at ATL like eight years ago or something like that. And I think the one of the first things I wrote was about the coming alternative fee arrangement thing. And that just never, I think I write one of those every year and it just doesn't, right. uh, doesn't get over the hump. Right. Uh, I yeah. Mean, how many how many of those alternative fees are really just like discounts on hourly rates? I mean, how many of how many how many how many of them were true alternative fees? A lot of them were just billable hours, but just you know different, you know, just just uh, either tied it up, you know, tied it up differently, or marketed differently, or called something else. I mean, it's just it just you know, especially for something like I mean, just even and, and you know, I mean, one thing that we've been reading about and just reporting and looking at is just like even 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 for clients, you know, like they want they want that predictability, they want that. To know, like, even with an hourly model, they want to know, okay, this is what's what's going to cost. This is what this is how long it's going to take and whatnot. And a contingency model, it just seems like it's just way too much variation. Like, you know. Well, it's. It, I did one back in the late '90s for a series of repetitive cases, and and we uh, we ended up <clears throat> setting a a flat fee for the year for all the cases with some collars on it. So if it was if it was too much below, then it went, there was a break and it was too much above, there was a, a, a fee break. And, and that worked pretty well, uh, you know, in terms of satisfaction by the client. Uh, although I remember when we first proposed it, the first comment was, well, you know, what's going to keep you from, you know, not doing any work and collecting a big fee. And I said, well, what's going to keep you from asking me to do all the work and, and, you know, getting free work. I mean, there's a certain amount of trust that has to go along with it to make it work. And I love doing it and really learned a lot about uh, how to manage, better manage cases and assess what was truly necessary to be done in, in cases to, to get a good result and, and looking for ways, alternative ways to resolve cases to get to the end. And um, it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. But, you know, it's, it was a hard, uh, hard to note, negotiate, navigate that within a bill, confines of a billable hour law firm. Yeah. Um, all a good argument for, for more data and analytics in, in law firm uh, billing uh, and, and time management. Um, and, and, I, and I think there's also a break that can be made uh, analytically uh, looking at different kinds of work too, because I, I remember when I was a pup lawyer way back, so not very long ago because I'm very young, but some time ago that uh, structured, like structured finance deals we were doing, uh, my firm was doing as a flat fee because those were very predictable transactional work that they could just churn out on a, on a fee, but litigation obviously was never gonna be that. And I think there's, there's ways in which we can identify different practice areas that have work that is, you know, that can be, can be handled that way efficiently. Well, and you know, criminal defense lawyers have always done flat fees. And I, I still have this, you know, I started my career as a criminal defense lawyer, went to a firm that did civil litigation and criminal defense. And we did um, civil litigation from both the plaintiffs and defense side. And for some reason, even though I did uh, handle my criminal defense matters on a flat fee, I, as a, a, from a civil litigation perspective, I always found it incredibly difficult to translate that to civil litigation. Even though arguably in many ways, you still, you should be able to predict how long, especially with um, slip and falls, for example, like those types of cases, they're pretty predictable. And you would think that you'd be able to predict um, what's gonna happen in a case, but 
or even a car accident. But sometimes you get all these like multiple in, you know, all this in indem- you know, all these indemnification actions stemming from one single action that you never expected. It becomes a lot more complex. And sometimes you'd have summary judgment motions on this one indemnification claim that, you know, arose from this original, what th- you thought would be a simple lawsuit. So the civil lawsuits seem to kind of expand unexpectedly in ways that criminal um, defense matters just simply didn't. But, you know, it's, it, it still seems in theory, you know, you should be able to do these flat fee, um, especially if your case, firms handle a certain kind of case over and over again. But it, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to translate if it's not how you normally do it. Yeah, it maybe the right model isn't it. even... So maybe the right model isn't even billing by the case. I mean, if, if again, if a law firm is really studying and analyzing its its work and its analytics over a period of time, then it, then maybe it doesn't come down to a matter of I made a profit on this case and I didn't make a profit on that case. Maybe if it's at the end of the year, we're making a good profit on all of the cases that we're handling. Maybe that's really all that matters. Yeah. And then there's a difference, too, between a flat fee and a contingency fee case that's that's kind of important because... With a contingency fee case, you do a really good job. There's a big bonus. I mean, you you have an opportunity to to get hit a big one, right? With a with a flat fee on the defense side of a case, nobody has yet come up with a way to 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 have that pot at the end of the rainbow. So basically, what you're doing is, you know, you're you're hoping that your costs are less than what the fee is, as opposed to, you know, my costs are going to be X and the result is Y and I get to share in the, in the bounty of the result. So the, the upside potential is a lot different, which also complicates the matter. But you make a good point, Bob. When I, I remember when I first started practicing law, I worked for a law firm that, that had a, a, a client uh, and without going into too much deal, what they did was it was a long-term client of the firm with substantial billings. And at the end of the year, the, the partner in charge of the, client would send a bill for services rendered with a number. And, you know, if the client was happy and thought it was fair, the client would pay it. And I, I guess if the client wasn't, it didn't, but. <laughs> well, me- meanwhile, the chat is flush with new ideas of how to uh, engage in alternative billing uh, <laughs> as uh, somebody appears to have paid for legal services with a bath with a new bathroom that doesn't work. That's great. Uh, <laughs> Um, what, one other story I was going to, I was just going to mention, I, I, I did also didn't put it in the spreadsheet. I'm guilty, but, uh, it kind of came out of a conversation we were having here a couple of weeks ago about, I wrote a column on above the law about the sort of this, this convergence of all these different legal tech marketplaces that sort of suddenly all seem to be coming out of, out of nowhere at more or less the same time. Uh, it, it, and it started, uh, what, just a couple months ago with this legal tech hub uh, getting launched, Nikki Shaver and her husband, Chris Ford, uh, launching this site that was going to be, a, you know, the world's most complete directory of legal tech companies. Uh, and then uh, in short order, uh, Aura Carrington is released to the public, this thing I guess that it had for a while called the Observatory, which is a, a directory of legal tech products. And Thomson Reuters announced its marketplace, which is again a, a kind of a directory of, of products that that integrate with its mostly with HiQ, I guess. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, where you can also one of the interesting things you can actually kind of test things out. Uh, and you know we all know Rain and Court is out there uh, and is moving along, and Rain and Court has also been working on introducing this sort of sandbox feature where you'll actually be able to kind of try before you buy uh, products uh, in brain and court. Uh, and I completely forgot in my above the law column to mention this other uh, site theorem that, that has been uh, in the works uh, and is going to be formally launching uh, sometime pretty soon. Uh, that is also uh, a legal tech directory and much more. Uh, and uh so uh, I, I just thought that was really interesting. And, and uh, the, the genesis of, of, of my writing that column was, was a conversation we all had here a few weeks ago. So it's okay to steal from the, our conversation, I guess, and, and write other stuff about it. Uh, anybody else have any uh, good of the order? Anything else they want to raise? Well, I wrote, I uh, threw an article in there about, I just wrote an article that was published today for the Daily Record. I thought it was really interesting. It was a West Virginia court case um, where a law firm 
um, was held not to be liable for one of those real estate email scam schemes. And essentially what had happened was the law firm used encrypted email to communicate to the plaintiffs, uh, possibly their realtor, I can't recall, but to communicate the uh, wiring instructions. But then what happened was that the, I think the plaintiffs, somebody, uh, either the realtor or the plaintiffs, uh, I think it was the realtor, may have sent the plaintiffs a screenshot of the wiring instructions through regular mail. And then there were all these conversations between the realtor, a broker, and the plaintiffs, you know, the, the purchasers of the property. Uh, over time, and somehow a company, uh, some scammers got involved and, you know, got in the middle of the conversation and changed the wiring instructions. And the $250,000 for the property disappeared into the ether, went, to, you know, went to account somewhere, disappeared, and that was the end of it. So the buyers, the plaintiffs brought an action against the broker, the realtor, and the law firm. And the court, for a number of different reasons, eventually the broker and the realtor settled. But the, this, the case that I wrote about was the West, the West Virginia Supreme Court concluded that the lawyer, the law firm was not liable because they'd use encrypted email. And, um, the, and then they also ruled that evidence that had been submitted by the plaintiff to try to prove that as a matter of course, they had an obligation to advise the plaintiff of these different kinds of um, risks and these real estate schemes so that they would have known to double check or, or that the lawyer should have called and double checked you know, that some other lawyers had some additional obligation to just using encrypted email. And they, uh, the court determined that the evidence that they tried to submit to prove that there was this standard of care that was breached in that regard uh, was insufficient because the person, the expert did know enough about West Virginia uh, law and lawyers and their customs. But at the end of the day, the law firm was off the hook because they'd use encrypted communication. So they didn't have to um, uh, reimburse the plaintiff in any way or they were held not liable. So I thought I thought I just thought it was interesting because it was a situation where the law firm did the right thing, and um, it, it was just sort of one more indication my law firm should probably start using some sort of encrypted communication. But it really caught my eye because that saved the day for the law firm. And I wrote about it, but it's up behind a paywall, so I can't. I can share the link, but you'll only be able to read the first, you know, two sentences. But don't you put the stuff <laughs> up on your own website too? I always find your columns on your website, but maybe I'm not supposed yeah. to find them there. I don't know. No, yes. I do put them up on the blog because I have permission to republish them. I just haven't. It was, yeah. it, right. it was, it's published in the paper on Monday and it was published uh, online today. So yeah. I just haven't had a chance to do that. I don't, yeah. I don't know if there's any cause and effect relationship here, but um, West Virginia, I think, is the only state that makes mandatory the comment, uh, comment eleven or eight, whichever it is, the technological competence uh, standard, which. Most places says that the lawyer should keep abreast of the risk and benefits, and the West Virginia version says the lawyer must keep. That's super uh, interesting. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, I, I didn't know I that. Think it's I gave a presentation in West Virginia not long ago, and I was kept having the, I kept reading it, going, "Wait, wait, it's different. It's it's must. That's not. It's not should. It's must." <laughs> Adriana just mentioned portals, and I, even with portals, the issue is still the client or uh, took a screenshot and you can't, you know, that's still, what are you going to do? Like, how can you, you have to kind of be vigilant, but you know, if your clients are going to take screenshots and share that information. Well, but in that situation, if everybody was part of that portal, all the people involved in the case, the realtor, the lawyer, the broker and the client, there would have been no reason for the client to take a screenshot and share it because it, or they or else they would have shared it through the portal. You know what I mean? Or the lawyer could have shared that information with everybody within the portal. So portals, portals, portals. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one other one other comment on that I, I happened to have on my uh, podcast this week, Andy Perlman, dean of Suffolk Law School, but who was also the reporter to the ABA Commission on Ethics 2020 way back a decade ago. That's that's what came up with the duty of technology competence and all of that stuff. Uh, and he was saying on the podcast how he was really surprised that the rule 1.1, the duty of tech competence stuff has been such a, 
a, a point of discussion uh, and focus in the year since because he just, everybody on that commission assumed that was already a responsibility of lawyers to be competent in technology. And he, what he thought was the most radical part of the reforms that, and these were adopted by the ABA in 2012, were the Rule 1.6 uh, provisions re, re, regarding a, a lawyer's duty to, uh, you know, to, to protect uh, confidential uh, data. Uh, and uh, he's been surprised at, at how little attention, relatively speaking, has been paid to that responsibility on the part of lawyers. So goes to show you. Uh, all right. Well, I think we are well out of time here, but uh, appreciate everybody uh, participating and uh, everybody uh, in the audience uh, staying with us. And we will be back next Friday. Same time, same place. Thanks, everyone. Weekend. See ya. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend, everyone. Take care.